the Lord. I'm going to start today in 1 Samuel chapter 30, if you want to turn there. But uh, we're going to go to a few scriptures before it's over. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want to remind you that um, we have a guest this coming Sunday. And uh, if you have any questions, Wendy knows about him more than I do. But uh, I understand he's uh, a live wire, so praise the Lord. Yeah, you're going to have a good time, is what I mean. Oh, he brings his guitar. All right, praise the Lord. Well, that's wonderful. So we invite you to come and bring a friend. Um, I know you'll be blessed. Anytime the Word of God goes forth, it's a blessing, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Um, Frank and Judy called me and said that they were doing well. They had a wonderful revival so far. In the Erie, Pennsylvania revival, uh, they had 85 people saved. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful, isn't it? So the one before that, it was 35, and then Erie, Pennsylvania, 85. So they are uh, doing a great job. And I, I forgot where they told me, I think in New Hampshire this morning, but I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, they're, they are ministering since, uh, I think it was Friday night there. And I have not heard from them on the new revival, but I'm sure that I will shortly, and I will keep you posted. They've asked me to send their love to you guys, that they love you and appreciate your prayers. And please continue to remember them in prayer as they're out on the front lines for Jesus up in the northern part of our United States today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Also heard from Gary and Dina. I don't know if all of you remember them, but I'm sure some of you do. And I gave the letter to Flo. If you'd like to read it after Flo and James are done, then you can read their letter. It, it is just a humorous story about him going through the self-serve checkout line at, at the uh, Walmart. Hallelujah. I always try to stay away from those. I, you know, I don't. I just wait in line. So anyway, that's what he was talking about. And it's uh, humorous. He said to please, uh, of course, give their love to all of you as well. They have moved up to, I'm not sure where they are. Do you know? Michigan. Yeah, so anyway, they're a long ways from us. In the natural, but close by in the spirit. And we love them, appreciate them. Hallelujah. God is good. Remember too, please, if you would, that uh, the first four, first three nights and the fourth Sunday morning, the one first Sunday morning, which is the fourth of September, we will be having our missions conference with uh, Daniel King here. Uh, so we invite you to please make plans for that as far as your scheduling goes and uh, try to be here as much as you can for it. I know you'll be blessed. And then we'd like to have a covered dish dinner Sunday morning after the service here. That would be on the 4th of September. So uh, uh, put that on your prayer list and uh, let's see what the Lord does there. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to be encouraged in the Lord this morning. The, the Holy Spirit gave me a message uh, on encouragement and discouragement. And so... I don't know what maybe you're going through or walking through this past week or month or even year, but uh, God wants you to be encouraged in Him. God is a God of encouragement, not discouragement. Hallelujah. So in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1, it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire. That's where David's family was, and where they lived, in Ziklag. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. They were distraught, distressed. 
And verse 5, And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him. That's pretty serious. Because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Hallelujah. That's what I want to talk about. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you teach us by your mighty Holy Spirit. Revealing to us your word that we might know you, Jesus, in your fullness in this day, in this hour here on earth. And Lord, we thank you for that. We look to you, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, to lead us and guide us this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. David was in a little bit of a spot there. And uh, so much so that his men were turning against him. Talking about stoning him, killing him. Uh, but David didn't just tuck tail and run, did he? Hallelujah. Instead, he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Hallelujah. Now, the people around him were not being, you know, so much of a support to him at this time. They were not encouraging him too much. The smell of smoke and the burning of the houses... The fact that all their children and their wives were gone um, was causing quite a, uh, uh, a rubble there. And so he couldn't look to his people for encouragement. He couldn't look to man because there was none that would encourage him. They were no telling what they were saying, but one thing that we know they were saying was that maybe we need to stone David. Look what he's done to us. Look where he's gotten us. And so David, instead of just giving up, instead of just uh, retreating, instead of just saying, well, sorry guys, I know it's my fault, but uh, I don't know what to do. David encouraged himself in the Lord. In the Lord his God. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of strength in the Lord God. Hallelujah. Well, he had every reason to, uh, in the natural, to want to throw in the towel. Did he not? Sure. I mean, I don't know what you're facing today, but uh, that's pretty serious that your family's gone and your house is burned and you have nothing. And even those that you uh, were in company with have turned on you. It's difficult to get much worse than that. <laughs> I mean, maybe you could, but that's bad enough. And so the answer here, which we're going to talk about, was the answer is that instead of just being fearful, discouraged, um, dismayed, distraught, he encouraged himself in the Lord is God. And that's a blessing. That's a lesson we need to learn. Verse 7 said, And David said to Abathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord. He sought the Lord. We call that prayer. Hallelujah. So David encouraged himself. Lord, how did he encourage himself? Well, he sought the Lord. He inquired at him. He prayed. He got alone with God. And he said to him, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake him? And he answered them, him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. And without fail, recover all. Now that's what the word of the Lord told David. 
Now, if he had have just gotten afraid and chosen to give up, he would have lost it all. It would be gone. Right? But instead, he sought the Lord. And when he sought the Lord, the Lord answered him. And the Lord said, go ahead and pursue him. You're going to get it all back. Hallelujah. So, let me just interject here that David had to believe what he heard the Lord say in order to act upon it. Otherwise, he would have still been back there and maybe stoned. So David went, verse 9, David went, he and the 600 men that were with him and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. So they were worn out. And 200 of them decided to camp there because they just couldn't go any further. They couldn't make it. So David took 400 and pursued. He didn't stop when some of his company dropped out, did he? <laughs> he didn't look at the numbers and say, oh no, I better not go any further. I better stay here at the brook also. Right? Are you with me? Verse 11, And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat and they made him drink water. They gave him a place of cakes, a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou and whence art thou? And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. Verse 14, We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master and I will bring thee down to this company you think this was coincidence <laughs> I don't think so the Lord planted this young man there for such a time as that verse 16 when he was brought him down behold they were spread abroad upon all the earth eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all, say all, all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. Verse 19. And there was nothing lacking to them. You hear that? There was nothing lacking. Neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughter, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. Now, I don't know where you're at today or what you're facing, but I'm telling you, God has given you the victory. Hallelujah. Whatever Satan has stolen from you in the past, you have recovered. Hallelujah. All. Not just some of it. All. <laughs> Verse 20. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drove before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. And David came to the 200 men which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial of those 
that went with David and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered. Save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. So some of the people were saying, well, these people didn't go help us, so forget them. We'll give them their kids and wives back and send them away. Then said David, you shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. David said, it's not you guys, it was the Lord. Hello? You just think it was you, but it's not you, it was the Lord. Verse 24, For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. So he said to him, We're going to share with these people the same as if they were down there. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. And when David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. Do you see how he had so much he was able to give to those who didn't go? And he came back and he even gave to the elders and said, Oh, here's a present. We've got lots of spoil here. Hallelujah. There was nothing lacking. He recovered all. Praise the Lord. But it would have been a different story if David had have let that discouragement set in. And then he had have fainted or quit or allowed them to stone him. Uh, it would have been a whole different story here in the Bible. Discouragement comes from a lack of courage. It's discourage, right? If I'm discouraged, then I am basically uh, down, uh, fearful, unbelieving. According to, to the Word of God. Now, don't get upset with me and Go get under condemnation if you've had a battle with discouragement. We do face those things from time to time, but we just need to learn to deal with them. Hallelujah. Let's look a little bit closer at discouragement. Look in Numbers 21. Numbers 21 and verse uh, 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. We see from this that the children of Israel were discouraged because of their circumstances. Because of what they found themselves in what they were seeing in the natural. The primary way discouragement enters your life is by your physical circumstances, what you're seeing, what you're facing, what you're dealing with. And when you allow those um, indicators to be stronger than the Word of God in your life, when you believe them more than you believe the Word of God, discouragement sets in now remember David had his city burned his wives taken away and the kids everything gone it was a great opportunity to be discouraged and then on top of that his men spake of stoning him it was a wonderful opportunity to be discouraged but if you become discouraged you're yielding into the enemy's playing field and he's going to sift you like wheat. He's going to eat your lunch, whatever term you want to call it. <laughs> now, you may feel like you have every right to be discouraged and feel sorry for yourself and have the mully grubs. <laughs> That's my own term. That's whenever your nose digs a trench in the dirt about a mile deep because you feel so bad you can't lift your head up. <laughs> Maybe you've never been that way, but I've faced it a few times. 
<laughs> Hallelujah. Well, that's Alabama talk, I guess. So anyway, discouragement sets in if you allow it to, and it will uh, take you further than you wanted to go. So David encouraged himself in the Lord, encouraged himself in the Lord, encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. In other words, he had to get his focus off of what circumstances were screaming at him and get it back on God. Now, we have to do that too. You see, I don't physically see God standing here. Hallelujah. But I don't see the wind either. That doesn't mean it's not there. I see the effects of God. I see the effects of the wind. So there is a realm outside of what I'm seeing. And the Bible says that it is the eternal realm. It's what lasts forever. What you're seeing is temporary. But you can easily get caught up in the in the flow of the flood of the tide going downstream of discouragement when your circumstances try to turn on you like that. And so you have to get with God and get refocused and quit letting physical, temporary things be Lord of your life. And get back to the Word of God. Jesus is our Lord. Look at Numbers 32. While we're in Numbers. Glory be to God. Numbers 32. Beginning with verse 6. Numbers 32, 6. And Moses said unto the children of Gad. And to the children of Reuben. Shall your brethren go to war? And shall you sit here? That's because they were wanting to stop before they got into the promised land. They liked where they were. And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord had given them. How are they discouraging them? Well, they were saying, we like it here. It's fine here. It's nice here. Why not just stay here? You ever heard those things? God has told you to do something. Yeah, but I'm pretty comfortable here, Lord. It's pretty nice here. Why would I want to do any change? Change brings different things, things I don't know about. And that's what was happening here. And the people were hearing what they were saying, and they were becoming discouraged because of what they heard the others say. So we see here that discouragement comes from your circumstances, more specifically from seeing your circumstances or hearing, hearing negative talk. Hallelujah. Verse 7 said, Wherefore discourage you the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. Verse 9. For when they went up into the valley of Eskol and saw the land... They discouraged the heart of the children of Israel. After seeing it, they believed it, and so they spoke it out of their mouth where others could hear. Verse 9, that they should not go into the land which the Lord had given them. And the Lord's anger was kindled the same time, and he swear, saying, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, Isaac, and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua the son of Nun. For they have wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. Hallelujah. So you see here that... Because of their discouragement, which basically is unbelief, they found themselves in a problem. And thinking that their 
answer to that problem would help them by their murmuring, complaining, their unbelief, it in fact turned the tables and made it worse. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Discouragement comes in from what you're seeing and what you're hearing. For your physical senses, in other words. You've got to get your five physical senses submitted to the lordship of the word of God. Hallelujah. Well, the word to you and I today, look in Deuteronomy just over a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 1. And Deuteronomy 1, and begin with verse 22. And you came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land, and bring us word again, by what way we must, come, we must go up, and into the, what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe, and they turned and went up into the mountain and came into the valley of Eschol and searched it out. And they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down unto us and brought us word again and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. Notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. See, the word of the Lord had told them to go up, but the people were saying something else. And you murmured in your tents, and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. Circumstances. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. Circumstances. What we're seeing. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakin there. Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which go before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness, where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bear thee as a man doth bear his son, in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet in this thing, you did not believe the Lord your God. We must go up and possess it. Hallelujah. Look at verse 21, 121. Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before us. Go up. It's the promised land. Hallelujah. In other words, the promises in the scriptures are yours. You're going to live in the promised land or are you going to live in the world? You're going to live how the world tells you to live, or you're going to live by the promises of God? Well, the circumstances will try to hold you down, shove you under. Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. Verse 21, the Lord says, he said it before you. Go up and possess it. As the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee, fear not. Don't look at what you're seeing anymore. Don't be discouraged. In other words, be of courage. Be strong. Be fearless. If God said it, I believe it. So I'm going to do it. Whatever. Hallelujah. Well, that's easy to say it. Not so easy to live it, is it? Well, that's why we must get control of our thought life. Because these things primarily attack us in the thought life. Hallelujah. You must remember that it's God that's done it. It's not you. Your job is to believe. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You must continually put yourself in remembrance that it's God's grace 
obtained through your faith. What I'm saying is that God has already won the battle for you. You didn't have to fight in that battle. You didn't have to do anything in that battle. You didn't deserve to be redeemed. You didn't deserve to be saved. But he did it anyway. That's grace. And so you and I must remember in everything we face that his grace is greater than the problem. And because his grace is greater, I, through my belief in that, through faith, possess it. What he has for me, the promise. Okay? Not by my works. I can't help him out. You know, we're keeping Kelly's, my middle son and his wife's kids, four days a week. They are, I don't know what their ages are, maybe five, three, and one or something. One, three, and four. Anyway, wow. In other words, they're, they are a handful. Beautiful, precious children. But little Nick, the middle one, loves to help. So I'll take him with me to help. What he doesn't understand is that in his helping, his heart's desires to help, in his helping, it really slows me down. You know, and I'm just saying that because he loves to help, and it's a good thing for him to help. I want him to help. Uh, but in God's eyes, it's a little different here. When you try to help God, you slow him down. can stop the move of God. Hallelujah. So you just have to let that grace be in effect. That means he did it all for me. And my real job is not to try to find ways to help God so that I can see it with my physical eyes. My real job is to see it with my spirit eyes by faith. And whenever I got it like that, it will manifest in the natural. Mm -mm. Hallelujah. Okay, are you with me? Romans 4. We're just starting to scratch the surface here. Hang in there. Romans 4. Verse 16. Romans 4, 16 says, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. What does that mean? It means that the victory is accomplished by faith. Simply believing. Not helping God. Not my works of, quote, righteousness. But my faith. So that it might be by his work. Exclusively. Do you see that? Therefore, it is of faith, Romans 4, 16, that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. In other words, if I could help God do it, maybe I could buy it, you know, with enough money. Or maybe I could comb my hair just right and look good enough to impress God and get it that way. Right? Or maybe, let, let's just really bring it home. Maybe I could spend enough hours praying at the altar to twist his arm just enough to get the answer. Now, prayer is a good thing. Please don't get me wrong. You need to pray. We're going to talk about that. But if you're praying thinking you're twisting God's arm because you're so good, you missed it. It must be a faith. That means simply believing in the grace of God. In his finished work. To the end that the promise is sure to everyone who can believe. No prejudice. It's not male or female. It's not what color skin I have. It's not how smart I am from... Um, going to ever how many schools I went to 
Do you see this? Faith is the means whereby everyone can participate without prejudice. Do you see it? And grace has already done it. So everyone that will choose to believe can have it. <laughs> oh, glory. What can we have? The promised land. All the promises. All the promises. All the promises in him are yes and amen to the glory of God by us. Hallelujah. Look in Romans 5, chapter uh, 5, verse 2. Romans 5, 2 says, By whom also we have access. That means entrance, right? Access. By faith into this grace. Do you see that? You see, if you think coming to church every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night is going to get you more grace just because you're coming you got a problem you're just religious <laughs> don't throw no tomatoes at me please it's good to come to church if you come to learn and to fellowship but if you're just coming out of a have to then you're coming from exterior reasons, religious reasons. But you're trying to help God here. You're coming by works. And it doesn't work that way. Verse 2 says, We also, we also, we have access, entrance, obtainableness by faith into this grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. God did it, and you and I get to enjoy it. Mm -mm. Now, if you're out of faith, outside of faith, you are outside of grace. Now, listen to what I'm saying. Don't get mad at me. If you are outside of faith, you have now placed yourself outside of grace because the way into grace is by faith. No other way. Can't earn it. Can't work for it. Can't be good enough for it. Can't buy it. Can't smell good enough, look good enough, seem good enough. It is by faith. In his finished work. Are, are, are you getting that this morning? <laughs> or you want me to say it again? <laughs> All right, now, number one, you got to remember to stay out of discouragement. We're talking about defeating discouragement. We're talking about being encouraged in the Lord. We're talking about when everything is mounted against you in the natural realm. When you feel like Notice I said feel. When you feel like, we don't walk by our feelings, do we? When you feel like, oh, woe is me, everyone's against me, everything is against me, how can I go on? You, you remember his grace by my faith enables me to partake of all his riches. Number one, that's what you got to remember. Not by you can't help him. You just have to believe him. The next thing is you got to know victory is ours. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what your checkbook's telling you. Doesn't matter what your body's saying. Victory is ours because grace has already been accomplished. It's done. It's mine if I believe it. Now, if I choose to believe pain in my body, I can have pain in my body. God won't stop it. Now, just as a side note, if that's the case, who's allowing it? Well, it's you. If you're a believer, it's you. 
Well, how can that be? Well, it's very simple. God does not lie. He said he has healed us. We are delivered. His grace says he's finished the work. My faith obtains it. Well, if my faith is not obtaining it, it's not God not that he's allowing it on me to just teach me something or something. It's because I have not quite got there yet. No condemnation, but just something I need to labor toward. Hallelujah. It didn't, didn't the Hebrew writer tell us labor to enter into that rest? Labor to believe. Well, it's a job to believe because I'm telling you, Satan is good at what he does. He's a deceiver and he's very good at it. Not to give him any credit today, but nevertheless, he's had a lot of practice. Let's put it that way. Many thousands of years before you even showed up on the earth, he was doing it and getting good at it. And so you have to recognize these things. And you have to recognize the victory is ours. It's already done. It's ours. Look in 1 Corinthians 15. These are some scriptures you need to put to memory so you can confess them when those uh, thoughts of discouragement try to come to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Victory is ours. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You are victorious today. You may not feel victorious. You may not look victorious. But you are victorious because of his grace. Hallelujah. 1 John 5, 4. 1 John 5, 4. Reads this way. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. That's why the uh, writer of Proverbs says, guard your heart with all diligence. Because according to what you believe is what you'll receive. According to what you believe is the way you will act. Be it good or bad. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Now, I, I, I don't know what your Bible says there. I don't know what the different translations, how they translate that. But I do know that King James says, whatsoever, not whosoever. Now, I believe God is specific in what he puts in the Bible. He didn't say whosoever is born of God. He said, whatsoever is born of God. So what does that mean? It means that as you're walking this walk, and you're a Christian, you are born of God, you are whosoever born of God, but there are things that present themselves in your life that you need revelation on from God in order to obtain and walk in your victory. Hallelujah. So, for instance, if, I don't know, where your all backgrounds are, but there was a time that uh, I wondered if God healed everybody, especially myself. <laughs> well, you know, when, when you're learning and you're walking as a baby in this, you hear all kinds of stuff, just like the children of Israel did, and some were discouraged and didn't go in. Why? Because they heard the wrong thing and believed it. Well, so I, I heard different things about healing, and I began to seek the Lord to find out whether or not healing was for everyone and in fact was it for me because I'm an everyone hallelujah and so whenever I got revelation my eyes were opened I was enlightened to the fact of the scripture saying yes everyone is healed then that revelation was a whatsoever in my life 
life. Do you see that? A whosoever is different from a whatsoever. And whatsoever is born of God means the light of God has shined there and given me understanding that I have in that area. And that overcomes the world. Hallelujah. So whatever discouragement you're facing this morning, you need a whatsoever in your life. You need that revelation of the Word of God, the promise of God being specific for you. And when you lay hold of that, oh, hallelujah, then you have overcome the world. And it's by your faith. Satan will continually try to discourage you by what you see and what you hear. But John 8, 44 says that Satan is the father of lies. Hallelujah. So who are we going to believe? We sing that song, whose report will we believe? I will re believe the report of the Lord. We sing it, but do we act on it? Hallelujah. How do I know what I believe? How, how, how do I really know uh, which one of the thoughts and the circumstances and the things that are pressing against me, how do I know which one to believe, what to believe? Do I believe what I see? Is that how I govern my life? Do I believe what I'm hearing from the masses? Lord, help us. <laughs> Hebrews 4 tells you the answer. Hebrews 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is alive, quick, the King James says, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul, mind, will, and emotions, and spirit. It divides between your emotional realm in the spirit realm and of the joints and marrow even the physical realm and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart distinguisher of the thoughts and intents of the hearts now how do I know what to believe how do I know which way uh, to go how do I know which thought to believe what what am I seeing how do I know on that which to believe the only way to know is not by your emotions, not by how you feel, not by whether it looks good or bad, because looks are deceiving. It's got to be by revelation of the Word of God dissecting, dividing, discerning between your emotions and what the Spirit of the Lord, the life of God, has for you. Hallelujah. You've got to seek Him. That's what David did, didn't it? Didn't he? Isn't that what we read? We read that it was a mess. It was burning. The smell of smoke was all around him. And, and all his uh, family had been taken away. And the men were ready to stone him. And David, in turn, sought the Lord. You know, emotions were running high in him. So he had to seek the Lord and let the Word of God separate, divide, and straighten it out. Well, you do too. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, You're to walk by faith <laughs> and not by sight. You are to walk by faith, not by what you see. You are to have faith in the Word of God, not in your circumstances. Hallelujah. So what do we do? The doctor gave us a bad report. You've got emphysema. You've got arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. You've got cancer. You'll never be right again. It's not, the, it, it, it's, it's not that it's the problem with the doctor. It's the devil trying to make you believe those things, trying to discourage you. Maybe, maybe money is pressing you. 
Maybe your checkbook is talking to you. It says, help me, help me. I have none. <laughs> well, you know, some people say, well, money can't talk. Oh, I don't know about that. It screams pretty loud sometimes to me. Well, it's discouragement talking to you. Hallelujah. What do we do? Well, you got to seek the Lord. Look in Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Do you see that? Men ought always to pray and don't faint. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't pass out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord, seek the Lord, a lot of people think that means just sitting back. Hmm. Ooh, okay, Lord. I'm waiting. Hmm, la, 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 la. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. If you go to a restaurant and you sit down at the table and the waiter does that over to the uh, counter instead of coming to wait on you, you pretty soon leave. Because you're not getting any service. But a waiter comes and serves. Waits on. Serves. That's what he's talking about here. They that wait upon the Lord. Seek his face. Serve him. Humble yourself. Get on your knees and seek him. They'll renew their strength. Instead of being discouraged. Hallelujah. They'll mount up with wings as evil. Eagles. Eagles. <laughs> All right. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run, not be weary. And they'll walk and not faint. Hallelujah. Do you see that? You can soar above the circumstances of life if you'll do this. Or you can get down in the, into the gutter with them. You know, if you want to be in discouragement and, oh my, what is happening to me? Oh me. Look in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. For which cause we faint not. We don't quit. We don't give up. We don't become discouraged. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, the circumstances pressing against you, which is but for a moment, doesn't seem like it, but God said it is, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Verse 18, very important. Why we look not at the things we're seeing, but at the things which are not seen, which will be the word of God. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen, they're eternal. Well, it's not a real hard decision to figure out whether I just want to be temporary or eternal. Right? Right? I'm going to go with the eternal. Hallelujah. So you've got to remember 
If discouragement is attacking, if discouragement is knocking at your door, in your thought life, in the circumstances of your life, you've got to remember it's grace, number one. It's finished, it's done, it's over. And you tap into it by, by your faith. So discouragement is, is a vessel whereby it's come to destroy your faith and to keep you out of grace. Okay? The next thing you've got to do is remember you have the victory. You're not going to get the victory. You have the victory. If I'm only going to get the victory, then I'm always like that little hamster in the circle and you know, running on it and not going nowhere because I'm always after it. Or like the donkey with the carrot out in front of his nose and I'm chasing the carrot all over the field, but I can't never get a bite of it. Hallelujah. Because future is not faith. Faith is now. Faith is now. So I have the victory now. Doesn't matter what I'm seeing. Doesn't matter what my circumstances are trying to tell me. According to the word of God, they are lying against the word. Hallelujah. The reason we say that is because the word of God is the truth. It's always the truth. It's the absolute. It's the plumb line. There is no counsel, no argument against it. Yet, there is uh, hordes of circumstantial evidence that presents itself in our lives contrary to the word. Now, which one is lying? The circumstances, not the word. The word cannot lie. So it has to be the father of lies presenting it in order to persuade us to go that direction. So what do we do? Well, we stand in grace by faith. We believe and confess that we have the victory. And we refuse to quit. I said we refuse to quit. Galatians 6 and 9. Y'all still with me this morning? Galatians 6 and 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if, say if, we faint not. You see that? You can't quit. If you quit, you abort it. You abort your blessing. You have to stay with it. It may look like it's pretty bad. It may look like, whoa, this time I'm going down. Doesn't matter. How do, I, how do I not quit? Well, I've got to keep doing what the Word says. I don't mean trying to shove doors open in the natural myself. That's, again, back to our works. It's not what I'm talking about. I mean get hold of the promises and do the Word of God. James 1.22 says, I'm not to be just a hearer of the Word, but I must be a doer. And when I'm a doer, then I get rid of deception in my life. Well, deception, Satan is the master of deception. And deception is what keeps you out of faith. Because if I'm deceived enough to believe that my circumstances are prevailing, then I'll allow them. I allow them. You hear me? I allow them. I'm deceived. How do I get rid of deception? By doing the word and don't stop doing it. Some people say, well, I, I tithed. I tithed for a month. And I didn't have any more at the end of the month. I had less. And so they give up. They quit. They faint. It'd be a sad thing to know that you were just right at the threshold. And you can't see it in the Spirit, see? You can't see what God sees. But God had you a special blessing, $100,000, and you aborted it because you got discouraged. You hear what I'm saying? Well, even, a, even $10, 1000 whatever. It's, it, it's, it doesn't matter. It's a blessing. And if you... Abort it because of your unbelief, your discouragement, your circumstances. Then you lose. 
Hallelujah. Be a doer of the word, expelling deception. Just keep on doing it. John 8, look in John 8. John 8 and uh, verse 32. John 8, 32. Now let's start with 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. See, there was a, there was a people that believed on him, and he said to them, If you really believe, if you continue in my word or to believe, then are you my disciples indeed. Verse 32, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Praise the Lord. So you see here, if they quit, the indication is if they quit, they miss the truth. They got deceived instead. They bought the package of deception because they wouldn't keep on. <laughs> because of their circumstances. But I... I confessed by stripes I was healed, but I still hurt. So finally, I just figured, well, I had to live with it. God was teaching me something. I just quit. No. You stay with it. You stay with it. You stay with it. By stripes I was healed, so I am healed. So devil, you're a liar. Pain, get out of my body. Disease, get out of my body. You have no right here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you don't stop just because the clock up there keeps ticking and tells you, well, it's been a year. You didn't see anything. <laughs> it's been five years. Where is God? Don't you, don't you back off. Don't you back off. You got to keep doing what the Word says. I can't do what the Word says unless I know what the Word says. I've got to meditate on what the Word says. We already said 2 Corinthians 1 20, all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. Mark 9 23 says all things are possible if I believe, but if I don't know what to believe, then I'm gonna believe wrong. Jeremiah 32 17 said, No thing is too hard for my God because he's the God of all flesh. You gotta meditate on these things, especially when you're having uh, pressure on you. You see, God has made a way of escape. It's up to you to use it. 1 Corinthians 10. Look at that with me because it's such a misquoted scripture. We need to read that one. I'm about done here. First Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. In other words, it's nothing different. Somebody somewhere has faced the same thing you're facing. But God is faithful. Say God is faithful. God is not the tempter. God is the faithful one. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able. Thank you, Lord. But will, with the temptation, doesn't say that God tempts you. It says alongside of the temptation. While you're in the midst of the temptation. He also makes a way to escape that you can be able to bear it. Do you see that? God is not the one doing it. The devil's doing it. But God hasn't left you because you're in temptation with the devil. You see it? He's right there with you. And he's so close to you that he's saying, here's the way out. Here's a door out. Here's the escape hatch. But are you listening? Hallelujah. It's available. He's made the way. How do I get it? Well, meditation, doing the Word of God. Set your face like flint and stand. Flint being a hard stone, hard rock. In other words, set your face that I'm going through. I am victorious. I am delivered. I am healed. And do not turn back. Hallelujah. Isaiah 50 and verse 7 tells us that. Set our face like flint, not being ashamed. We're not going to turn there. We're running out of time. Ephesians 6 and 13 says, Having done all to stand, stand. 
<laughs> Glory to God. Now, I've had people come to me. They've been discouraged with the Word of Faith movement. They said, but you know, I did it all. I did everything. And it didn't work. Well, you're full of pride. You didn't do everything or it would have worked. You're saying God is wrong and you're right. I don't think so. I'm telling you, if it's not working, it's not God's fault. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Let's go to maybe two more scriptures. Maybe, I said. Deuteronomy. Go back to Deuteronomy. I think this is the crux of the matter here. Deuteronomy. Chapter uh, 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 23 says, Deuteronomy 6, 23. And he brought us out from thence, from the muck and the mire of this world, that... He might bring us in. Ha! That's my motto. He brought me out to bring me in. He's not leaving me out in the cold. He brought me out of the junk to bring me in to the victory. Hallelujah. To give us the land which he sware to our fathers. A promised land. I live by the promises of God. Hallelujah. Philipp Philippians 1 6 says, I'm confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in me will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Victory is ours. I am says I am, so I am. Hallelujah. Psalm 66 12 says, I am, says I am, in my wealthy place. 1 Peter 2, 24, I am, says I am, healed by his stripes. Amen. Glory to God. 2 Corinthians 2, 14, I am, says I am, always triumphant in him. Mm, mm, mm. Psalm 119, 98, I am, says I am, wiser than my enemies. They can't defeat me. I am, says I am, Exodus 15, 26, immune. I am immune. From the diseases of this world. That's an American translation. The Bible translated, it's called an American translation. I got that Bible first through uh, Lucy, gave me the 26 translations, and I found it in there. And it was so good, I ordered that Bible from Amazon, I believe, Amazon.com. I'm not certain that it's even in print anymore, but I got a copy. And uh, there were other copies on there. There was some, a couple years back. Uh, but it says, Exodus 15, 26, it says, it translates that verse that he blesses our bread and our water and he has made us immune to the diseases of this world. Mm, 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 I am, says I am, so I am immune. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Glory. I am, says I am, so I am forgiven. Psalm 103.3. Ephesians 1.16. I am, says I am, so I am accepted in the beloved. 2 Corinthians 5.21. I am, says I am, so I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In Revelation 12.11. I am, says I am, so I am. An overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. When I don't love my life, I love him. Glory to God. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word this morning. We're a grateful people, Lord, for your grace. We thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. And we receive it by faith this morning and refuse to yield to discouragement any longer. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father. We thank you, Lord. We're not going to look at the temporal. 
but we look at the eternal and we change the temporal by the eternal because you are Lord of all and we thank you Lord in Jesus mighty name everybody said Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.